a second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom, freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care, and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accidents, and unemployment, the right to a good education. All of these rights spell security, and after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. Welcome back to Why Are We Like This, the podcast that treats Florida like the active crime scene it is. I'm David Quinones. My co-host, Tomas Kennedy, has been urgently called away to consult on Laura Loomer's next failed congressional campaign. But don't you worry. We are joined, of course, by our other co-host, Gerald Doherty. Hello, Jerry. Hello. How are you? Doing good, man. Thanks for, for joining me on this fine Absolutely. Wednesday evening. Yeah. Um, and today we are joined by Professor Mark Paul, an economist who is an assistant professor of economics at the Edward J. Bluestein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. He is also a member of the Rutgers Climate Institute. Uh, his recently released book, The Ends of Freedom, is on bookshelves and online now. You can and should order it, uh, just like Gerald and I did, uh, by going to markpaulecon.com. And you can follow him on Twitter at Mark Vin Paul. That's Mark V I N P A U L. Mark Paul, welcome to Why Are We Like This. Oh, it's great to be here. And uh, I'm sorry I'm not joining you in the warm, sunny state of Florida today. You know, I spent my past four years down there, but I have since forth escaped to the Garden State. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> escaped to the Garden. You, you pulled the old reverse Springsteen. Um, <laughs> uh, I did. Usually, Jersey sends its crazy drivers to Florida. Here we have. We, Florida sending its excellent professors we're, up to New Jersey. I was sending our economics. Yes. I wasn't Florida man enough for Florida, so they kicked me out. They rejected you out. wholesale. Yes, sometimes that happens. Sometimes uh, we all feel the gravity of that uh, currently. Listeners <laughs> um, won't know this, but I'd say Professor's fit today is is very like Florida, like very easy breezy, nice dad hat. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, th- I think you're. I think you're selling yourself short a little bit. Yeah, I could see you very easily, like um, you know, going, uh, taking the kids horse riding in Ocala in that outfit. Yeah, yeah it's a good, it's a good. Yeah, <laughs> going to like a tourist trap in Winwood and being like, this place sucks. Like, I can see it. So we want we want to talk about the book, um, uh, Mark. But um, first, I, I, one thing I couldn't help but notice, and I love to talk to we love to talk to new authors or um, folks who have some you know fresh material out there, and. Uh, just ask you how the process went in getting the book out and, and like getting blurb, you got blurbed by uh, Thomas Piketty and like all these like kind of big names mm. in your, in your, um, in, in your area. How, how's it been? Uh, the book just came out like two weeks ago. So what's, what's it been like? Oh, it's been great. You know, first of all, writing a book was kind of like having a kid. I mean, as, as a matter of fact, I have a 10 month old, which is why I'm currently covered in flour, though listeners can't <laughs> see this. But, you know, my, my 10 month old was helping me make pizza earlier. Uh, and, and you know, the, the book and that kid uh, essentially were fully baked roughly around the same time. Nice. Uh, and so, <clears throat> you know, I had this idea for this book. Uh, that really started in the 2016 presidential primary. If, if you all remember this frumpy old senator named Bernie Sanders, I think a few people might have heard of him, heard of uh, him. Decided, to, decided to run for president. And uh, everybody called him crazy, right? You know, people were saying things like $15 minimum wage is going to bankrupt the nation and Medicare for all. Nobody will ever work again and all these things. And as an economist, I said, you know, hey, is that true? And I kind of wanted to take a step back and, and think about these issues. And I never really dreamed of writing a book. But as I kind of dug into the history of progressive policy in the United States, as well as the economic claims around the ideas that, that Senator Sanders and kind of other progressives were championing, I realized that there was you know important space to be filled to, to write a book and to kind of put out an affirmative vision for what an economy that works for the 99% can and should look like grounded in the American story. And we're always told this story of, you know, America means no taxation. America means 
you know, limited government. Well, you know what? That's a lie. And in my historical research kind of helped lift up the untold story of America. And uh, so I decided to set out to, to write this book, which has just been really a, a joy. It took about a year and a half to write, you know, uh, sat down and, and stared at the computer screen. And some days a sentence came out and other days multiple pages came out. And, uh, you know, at the end, uh, voila, you've got a book. Um, and it's been a, a really fun process. So I wanted to follow up on the on what you were talking about, like rooting this like progressive project in American history. Because um, I remember in the 2019, I guess the 2020, 2019, whatever you want to call it, uh, for, uh, version of the Bernie campaign, he would make allusions to like FDR and Dorothy Day and Martin Luther King and everything. And I think, you know, t- I think took some... I don't want to know if you want to call it flack or what, but like felt like he was paying lip service to like American history, I guess, and not, you know, speaking to, um, I, I guess, th- like creating a narrative arc that we've always been on our way towards realizing this project. Like you root this, I mean, as basically from like Thomas Paine all the way through to like Dream Defenders and DSA and what have you, like that this claim for like economic rights as human rights has a long history. I guess my question would be that the, uh, the the flip side of that coin is that like America also is like, you know, a settler colonial state, like there's a, a very violent project. And you touch on a lot of those injustices in this book. It's not like you're, um, you know, like, like papering them over, you go into very, you know, stark detail. Um, I just want to ask like navigating that tension of like, there's this long tradition, but it's like a 200 year tradition that hasn't been realized. And then like it, we want to root it in the American spirit but we also realized that the injustices that we're trying to overcome are also rooted in the American spirit, like how, how you navigated that and how you positioned the, I guess, the historical framework of the progressive uh, movement and the movement for economic rights. Yeah, a great and uh, I'll say slightly loaded question there. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, I, I think that what I was trying to do is provide a counter story. Okay. Conservatives have effectively weaponized the idea of freedom and, you know, a, kind of supplanted it in people's minds that freedom means limited government coupled with access to markets. And they've kind of argued that this has always been the only vision of American freedom since day one, right? The Bill of Rights are all about what rights we have from our government, things like freedom of speech, government can't interfere with that and the like. And we need those freedoms, don't get me wrong. We absolutely, you know, must protect freedom of speech and, and other, um, you know, crucial freedoms. But What I was trying to do is lift up the fact that we have this alternative kind of more meaningful and enduring vision of freedom that included things like free speech um, and the like, but also included the fact that people are, you know, to be truly free, need basic economic needs met. They need, you know, a right to a job, a right to basic income, a right to health care and the like. And as you just mentioned, you know, many of the founders, including the more radical founders like Thomas Paine and Alexander Hamilton, fought for these rights. And we can actually draw a kind of a, a, a historic arc um, towards you know, people like Lincoln and the radical Republicans right. through Roosevelt um, to the civil rights movement. Now, that's not to say that America is perfect. That's not the story I'm selling. All right, I'm right. saying is that the American story is complex. Right. Yes. American history is rooted in settler colonialism mm-hmm. and folks interested in that idea, go check out the work of Aziz Rana. Mm-hmm. He's, he's two faces of American freedom is a brilliant book that I, I really recommend. Um, but I also think that, you know, progressives can't just point to Finland and France right. and Denmark and say, look what they do. Right. We not only do we need an American story, but we have an American story that we've indeed papered over that we've really whitewashed i mean king is the best example when you know after the passage of the civil rights act and voting rights act martin luther king turned his attention full-time to securing universal economic rights for everybody now i bet you you ask a hundred college graduates and not one of them could tell you that and i think that is a fundamental failure that we are dealing with right now. And and of course that didn't just happen, right? That was intentional. It was intentional that we lift up the civil rights movement for their, you know, for their push to secure political rights for all Americans. But we intentionally, you know, kind of pushed the side the social program that would have actually engaged in, you know, economic claims on resources 
Um, and, and so that's the history I'm trying to lift back up. So we know that when we're fighting for things like Medicare for all, these aren't, these aren't ideas that, you know, are a new or b foreign. They're ideas that have a deep history here in the U S that we've intentionally forgotten. And and we forget it. I think at our own peril. There there was this thing. I don't know if you guys remember this. Uh, what what age you guys <laughs> you both uh, are when this happened? But there used to be this uh, this this little piece of um, decorative exterior that people would put on their homes. Uh, that was a uh, an eagle, a metal eagle, metallic like kind of tin eagle. And it, when I was a kid, it was as it was explained to me, it was meant to mean the freedom of having paid off your home. Mm-hmm. People who Pay, who's more who had no mortgage and for whom it had paid off it, the mortgage was paid off uh would hang this this eagle this metal super american you know iconographic eagle and um and i i i noticed on a recent trip north through the state uh, of florida um some people have are, are hanging uh, still have that as like sort of a you know accoutrement on the side of their house and i i i feel like it's it has a different meaning these days. It's much more symbolic and political and uh, more about the concept of like a, a partisan type of freedom. And it, it strikes at kind of what you were talking about. I'm wondering if you, if, if that like is something that you've, um, you know, encountered a lot in the research for the book is this changing idea of what freedom is this sort of, I wrote down in my notes, this perversion of what the idea of freedom is, right? Like where it became, it's become this almost like a, like freedom brought to you by target or something right. like that. It's, it's like a retail freedom as opposed to something that was much more like right. economic and like, and, and real to people use the phrase kitchen table issues, but like what's more kitchen table issue than being able to pay off your home. And then, you know, not to proselytize too much, but like here in Florida, good luck paying off your house, first of all, because of the, you know, skyrocketing cost of living. But second of all, because of other, you know, coercive things like, uh, you know, insurance, the crowd, which we've covered on the show at, at, um, at, at nauseum, uh, the, the cost of skyrocketing, skyrocketing property insurance. I'm wondering, is, is that something that like that, that sort of decay of the understanding of freedom that you encountered a lot? You know, it is. I I think that unfortunately we do have kind of short memories, right? And so this current notion of freedom that's dominant in our political discourse today, I think is a fairly new and fairly radical vision of freedom of, you know, as Grover Nook has put it, shrinking government down to size so you can strangle it in the bathtub. I mean, that's kind of what freedom people think about when it comes to freedom today. I mean, you know, with the rise of, of Trump, you have the resurgence of the don't tread on me flag, which is, you know, really about, you know, keeping government out. But here's the thing. When that flag came into fruition, it was a mark of the United States fighting against a monarchy, right? A single person that had never stepped foot in this country trying to rule the, you know, all of the colonies. Today, we are a, pe- a country that is of the people, for the people, by the people. We, our you know, government is a democracy. And so, you know, pushing against the government is pushing against ourselves. It's pushing against our community. Uh, you know, instead, what we need to do is, is reclaim, you know, uh, our freedoms and our government and ensure that we hold them accountable to deliver on, you know, Jefferson's promise of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. I mean, that's what people used to think of when we talk about freedom. Uh, and, and, you know, what's, what's fascinating here is that Jefferson had a fairly radical vision and Jefferson's idea of freedom, which conservatives mainly point to today, everybody was a landholder. Everybody was largely self-sufficient, you know, it was very uh, self-sufficient economically because yeah. they had a claim on land. Um, you know, it was an agrarian society, and it's very different from where we find ourselves today. But if we kind of take Jefferson's ideas and and bring them into the 21st century, you know, we come to the realization that we need to to substantially restructure the economy away from maximizing short-term profits and and you know generating lots and lots of shitty jobs, which you know companies like Target are great at. And, and towards, you know, providing basic needs for everybody, things like, you know, ensuring there's sufficient affordable housing, which in Florida there absolutely is not right now, you know, ensuring there's sufficient employment opportunities, despite, you know, a record hot labor market, we still have millions and millions of Americans unemployed and tens of millions working in poverty level wage you know, jobs. And, you know, the fact of the matter is these are all policy choices. You know, as a policy economist, I studied the economy. 
And that's the thing that really shook me to the course, realizing it doesn't need to be the way it is. We choose for it to be this way, or you know, better yet, that one tenth of one percent chooses it for <laughs> to be this for way. Else. You know, you you and I certainly don't. <laughs> um, yet here we are, you know, stuck playing this game of monopoly where where you know the most of us are getting screwed while a couple people are are running away with the bag. And uh, I'd instead like to to opt out of, of the game of Monopoly and figure out how can we play the game of life where, you know, people have, have basic dignity and, and basic opportunities. I mean, a lot of these issues aren't left or right issues. I mean, everybody wants the ability to work for a decent wage. You know, everybody wants to be able to put a you know, roof over their, ta- their head and food on their table. I mean, that's not a, a left or right question. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of space here to, to bridge our political divides and, and figure out how we can can get, you know, kind of secure economic rights, realizing that political rights and civil rights and, and of course, our reproductive rights, which are especially coming under attack in Florida, you know, aren't, aren't enough to secure meaningful freedom, that we also need economic rights in order to fully participate in our democracy. Just saying, like, um, in, the, in the present moment, I think one of the uh, parts of your book that like reading it felt like shaking off dead skin was your analysis of like COVID-19 as an economic event and not just like a biological, like medical phenomenon that like it was fuel on the fire for the injustices that existed in society already and exacerbated them. And it like did produce in me like read, like reading like all your detail and like um, on that moment, it did produce like this feeling of like nausea within me of like right now where back in the 2010s, I felt like there was like this like cheering for the number to go down among the Democratic Party, whereas in the 2010s, it was stubborn unemployment and now it's stubborn inflation. And this like, I think like naive idea that once we get that number low enough, everyone will be ha- everything will be fine and everything will be happy. And I think you, you this book does a very excellent job of outlining just why that is naive thinking that the 2010s was a period of like tremendous economic growth. And it was felt by very few people because most people were not invited to participate in the benefits of that or receive the benefits of that growth. Um, I just want to ask if you can walk through, um, what is it? Um, I guess COVID-19, like the role that it played in exacerbating the, um, I guess, existing injustices like through the 2010s and, and I, where I feel like a lot of the, um, and like there should be a lot of energy around these demands, like especially now, like a lot of the coverage that you'll see about like crime, like it's just poverty that they're describing. Like they're describing visible poverty that we've all just decided to accept. This is going to be how we live our lives now. This is, this is it. Anyone who suffered, sorry, like that's it. Um, I feel like there's like great potential for agitational energy given everything that happened, um, how, you know, when the markets were tanking, we d- will just invent trillions of dollars and inject it into the financial system to save the Dow. But as people are getting a, like, ma- like mass evictions and now rent, massive rent hikes, um, I just helped a friend move um, because it was either uh, a $1,200 increase in her rent or a $500 increase at another apartment. And she just decided to eat the $500 cost. Like th- th- there is like tremendous discontent right now that I feel like like potential to rally around the kind of program that you're yeah, describing. People are pissed. Yes, but I don't, you know? but, but it I feels mean, like we're sleepwalking. Like, I feel like we are so yeah. exhausted from COVID-19 that it feels like we should just be grateful to even be here. You know, we're the yeah, kind, we're I the mean, kind of pissed that you are when you like wake up in the middle of the night and you, have, and you have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. You're like, we're pissed, <laughs> but we're the, we don't have any like verve to do anything yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah no, we're, we're pissed and sitting on our couch, angrily eating popcorn and binge yes. watching that, you know, the next show. And calling it self care. Too- yes. Well, yeah, but it's, <laughs> because people are too tired because we're working just nonstop. I mean, uh, just to put this in perspective, Americans work a month more than the average German. A month more. Uh, Germans not poor. Germany's not poorer than us. In fact, Germany is you know roughly just as well off as we are. Yet they choose to let their people have a month more, uh, an extra month every year to go on vacation with their families, to hang out at the community swimming pool, to hike in the woods. I mean, whatever. I mean, or to you know go down to your your local jazz club. I don't know, whatever, whatever form of leisure tickles your fancy. Um, so yeah, people are pissed, but they're too tired to do anything right. about it. And guess what? That's by design too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to keep people tired so that they don't organize us so that they don't agitate. So, you know, the, the thing about the economy is that it doesn't work for most folks right now. You know, it works pretty well for say those in the top 20% or so. Um, but you know, 
We have 40 million Americans in poverty today. That's the exact same number of Americans that were in poverty when President Johnson launched his famed war on poverty in the 1960s. And it's the exact same number of Americans that were in poverty when President Roosevelt took the helm during the height of the Great Depression. You know, yes, we have a larger population today, but we're also a rich country. I mean, I'm talking to you, uh, you know, via the internet. Uh, we each have a personal computer, which is more powerful than any computer the government had in the 1960s. You know, we have cell phones, you know, we have electric cars, we have all these beautiful things, functional things surrounding us, but for some reason, we still have poverty. And, you know, that's a question, um, you know, both a moral and economic question we need to grapple with. But what I try to highlight in the book is it's not just that we have poverty, which is you know, a, a deep travesty that should elicit genuine moral outrage in each and every one of us. But we also have, you know, most Americans living one emergency away from the brink. I mean, you know, a third of Americans don't have $400 in their bank account to finance an emergency expense. I'm a professor. I have good health insurance. If I go to the ER, let me tell you, it's going to be more than 400 bucks. Yeah. You know, like if you blow a tire on our shitty roads, it's going to be more than 400 bucks. So people really are living paycheck to paycheck. And, and you know, the reason is, is the rent is too damn high and the wages are too damn low. Now, you know, is that because it's that's how it has to be? Otherwise, you know, we're on the path towards, you know, towards, uh, Serfdom, as as you know, Hayek said in his right. famed "The Road to Serfdom." No, absolutely not. You know, we can change the rules of the economy. In fact, we write the rules of the economy. They're not some natural, you know, God-given laws. We get to dictate how we structure the game. You know, what types of floors or safety nets that we put in it. Right? People like to talk about the, the safety net of the government. Well. Yeah, you know, I kind of say screw the safety net. Let's talk about building a well-being state instead to ensure that everybody, you know, is is actually taken care of. I mean, you know, this United States we are unfortunately deeply divided politically right now, but we still are one big country, one big community, and we need to think much more deeply about how to take care of one another because we're all one accident away from living on the streets, and you know, it's 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 a choice, and and it's time to choose something different. No, I was just going to say that I remember like, <clears throat> it's ridiculous, the movie Cinderella Man, where, uh, the, uh, not Jake LaMotta, the, you know, um, uh, the, the Russell Crowe, you know, main character gets public assistance for a period of time. And then there's a point of pride that he goes back and he pays it all back. He pays back all the, all the, all the public assistance after he, you know, becomes a successful boxer again. And I just, I think about that and I think about how like, even just, um, like dialectically the way that we've turned a lot of this stuff into pejoratives like welfare like we have to come up with this new term like well-being i love that idea of like us like creating a, a well-being state but it's like we have to do it because the concept of welfare has been made you know so negative jerry we talked about this yeah. a few weeks ago on an episode when we were talking about public housing and how just if you've grown up in America in the last 50 years, public housing just means hood. It's a, bu- it it's a buzzword, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And and I, I feel like it, there's almost like if we're going to switch things around, it almost like it, if we're going to if we're going to you know capitalize on this, this energy, this anger, the first mention of any of those buzzwords just leads to divisiveness. And it almost feels like the first change that needs to happen economically would, would have to be one in how we talk about this stuff uh, is it uh, did you get that feeling as well that in in, in kind of like f- w- like researching this book yeah yeah you know it's a great question so so i have a couple thoughts here i mean you know first of all you know i do want to push back ever so slightly you know uh, i think the sanders campaign is a great example of this where you have a lot of sanders to trump voters mm-hmm. and it's because sanders just told people how it was you know like i mean he basically explained to people that look Y'all are getting screwed and it's time for us to take on, you know, the, the one percent or really the one tenth of one percent and uh, take care of ourselves, take care of one another for a change. And so we actually went out and polled the American people on this idea of an economic bill of rights, which I propose in the book. And it turns out two thirds of voters strongly support it, including the majority of independents and Republicans. You know, kind of people want their basic needs met. I mean, they get that in the economy. Sometimes you fall down, right? Sometimes you have to go on public assistance. But 
the thing is, is that A, that public assistance shouldn't be stigmatized. So I totally agree with you. It is right now. And, and B, you know, that, that public assistance needs to be high quality. Now, you know, why is it stigmatized? Well, it's stigmatized because we made shitty programs for the poor. And, at, you know, this, there's this great quip, programs for the poor make poor programs. And I think that's absolutely true. And that's what leads to stigmatization. So public housing is a good example. Yeah, public housing in America is stigmatized because public housing tends to be, you know, low quality housing, you know, largely for low income or exclusively for low income people. And also it increases segregation. So, you, you know, you're often seeing people of color that are just, you know, in economic destitution living in public housing. Now, you know, I went to Austria uh, to the lovely city of Vienna a couple of years ago. Yeah. And this is back when I'm in grad school and I walk into my friend's flat and I'm walking around and I'm just thinking to myself, shit, what does your dad do? And the reason I'm thinking <laughs> that is because she has a beautiful flat downtown Vienna standing on her porch, you know, overlooking this basilica. And I'm just like, wow, like, you know, your dad must be a banker or a doctor or something. And I, I finally ask her a couple of glasses of wine in she's, it's public housing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is public housing and it is just gorgeous and unfathomable your brain broke uh, yeah, it yeah, just snapped it, it, yeah. I, literally my jaw was on the floor and you know through talking to her and then f later on through doing my own research i realized that the vast majority of people in the city of vienna which has been rated the most livable city in the world 10 years running the vast majority live in public housing and the vast majority pay roughly half of what new yorkers pay per square foot okay and why is that? Because the government wielded it, because the government created high quality public housing that wasn't just for the poor, that wasn't just put in low income communities, but was made for everybody. Right. And it's when you make high quality public programs that serve, you know, the middle class, the low, you know, the low end of the economic spectrum and the wealthy all together, that's when you get high quality public services that are no longer stigmatized. So I agree we need to change how we talk about it, which is precisely why I work on to reclaim freedom here in the book. But I also think that we really need to change how we design the programs too. Because if they're universal programs that benefit everybody, they're going to be high quality programs and they're not going to be stigmatized. This is why I think Hillary Clinton was dead wrong in 2016 saying that she didn't want to pay to send Donald Trump's oh, kids yeah. to college. I'll pay to send yeah. his kids to college. And guess yeah. what? He'll pay for it because we have something called a progressive income tax. And that's how we should redistribute income, not through, you know, nickel and diming people, you know, for, during their, you know, as kids are trying to fill up their FAFSA rather than focus on their education. Yeah, I would say personally, like my one of my political awakenings in around maybe 2014, 2015 was the understanding that um, like the minute that you means test a program, you're basically just saying this is the path for it to fail. Here's how here's the map. If you're hey. Hey there, conservatives, if you're yeah. curious about how you could knock out the, the the supporting struts of this program, here's the map. And that's basically what I'll, what a lot of these, what, what the means testing of these, of, of, like when you implement that, I love that idea that or I love, I love the, the explanation that you just gave of like programs for the poor, make for poor programs. That's exactly what it is. I was going to say, I, I thought it would be a good time since we, we keep talking about the program that we should go through the specifics of uh, the Economic Bill of Rights uh, in the book. Um, so we've got, are we sure we, that we want to give away the strategy? Yeah, why not? Like, are, are we sure that we want the, we to <laughs> our listeners? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I think that the listeners have an economic right to hear the program. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we have the right to housing, the right to meaningful work, right to education, right to healthcare, a basic income and in banking and a right to a clean, uh, environment. I understand why, like you said, even independents and Republicans um, would be supportive of such a program because it's, it like sounds so, it would sounds like, would, do you want your life to be better? And if, yes, I do want my life to be better. Um, but like we said, there are people who, like we were saying there, like in order to have these programs, you're going to need everyone on board. The one strata of society that I think would be disinterested in making people more economically secure would be the class of people that benefit from, the economic insecurity of working people, which is yeah, like the, the, the ruling world. class, basically. Um, I think if you were to ask them, would you like workers to have more freedom? I think they would say, I would not like that and neither would my shareholders. That, that, that is right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason we always have unemployment. Right. Got to keep workers in check. Yeah. 
So I wanted to ask, uh, it's, a, it's a speculative question, but let's like, let's just say, let's game out. We have elected like an entire Congress of like AOCs and we have like a president AOC also. Like we have like, like Congress is stocked with people who are bought into this. At that point to me, it seems like the risk of retaliation from the ruling class, whether it's capital flight, disinvestment, whatever, whatever leverage they can put on the political system to try to kill this, they probably will. I think that it would be in their interest to do so. In the, in the last pages of the book, you talk about the need as it was for the uh, movements for the New Deal, as it was for the movements for civil rights. It's going to take a mass uh, movement of people and struggle um, for these rights as well, that nothing was ever given. It was won, you know, um, and, and demanded. Um, so I just wanted to walk through, obviously, like, you, like, you know, you're an economist and, um, you're putting together like an economic program, but I wanted to talk about, I guess the role that like ordinary people can play in struggling for like this economic bill of rights. It, it sounds like something that would make my life better. I know that there's uh, you know, a group of people who would not like to see it pass. And unfortunately for me, that group is the most powerful class of people who maybe have ever existed in human history. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just, I want to talk about like the power dynamics of like actually getting it through, I guess. It's, it's a group that is incredibly powerful, and it's also a group that is incredibly politically motivated and engaged, mm-hmm. precisely because they know that their very existence rests on continued capture of our political system. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, look, can we do these things? Yes. What I lay out in the book is that these things are not only economic fe- economically feasible, but will lead to an economy that works for us all rather than all of us working for our economy. It's time that we flip that on its head and, and make sure that the economy is serving us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I actually go through the, the, you know, nickels and dimes and talk about how it is that we'll, you know, pay for, pay for these types of programs. Cause often people will say, Oh, they sound, you know, good and well, but uh, good luck financing. And, yeah. and as an economist, I, I tackle that in the book. So, yeah. so to get those details, maybe folks will have to have to pick up their copy. It's yeah. it's only uh, twenty seven bucks. It won't break the bank. Um, but you know, look, I I think that what is really crucial is that more people become you know politically engaged and motivated, and it's hard. Precisely because one, we just none of us have enough time. You know, time is our most precious commodity. We always talk about scarcity in economics. Time is our, our truly scarcest resource. I mean, you know, be it that you have to work forty-seven hours a week to make ends meet, or even have to pick up a second job, or you know, hey, we all have kids where we have limited daycare because daycare costs more than college in most states these days. You know, time is just scarce. And so the limited time we have, we often want to spend with our family and friends, but we also need to you know, spend some time engaging our political system. But it can be really frustrating because the political system's rigged to, to stop, you know, everyday people from really becoming engaged. I mean, it's, it's really rigged to, to benefit wealthy individuals and, and high income donors. So I, I do want to motivate folks to, to become more engaged politically. And also, you know, one of the reasons I, I wrote a popular book here is to help people become more economically literate. So then when somebody tries to hoodwink them and say, you know, yeah, $15 minimum wage, great idea, terrible policy. Yeah. That's what you have a lot with progressives. You know, people will say, oh, great intentions, but let me explain yeah. why your policy will really, you know, backfire. That was my but dad. A, that, that was my dad, my entire upbringing. I, I, yeah, I can hear him in my head. Yeah. You know? I love him. But, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. but, no. You know, so so I, I put my you know economic wonkery skills to work and try to arm readers with the the arguments that they need to debunk all the classic you know conservative talking points against these ideas. And I think that's that you know information is power. And so you know the hope is to to motivate people and to mobilize people around this unifying idea. And I think the Economic Bill of Rights is really powerful in that respect because, you know, one common criticism of, of, you know, kind of progressives is, you know, they want college for all. They want Medicare for all. They want a Green New Deal. They have a laundry list and, right. and there's no connective tissue. And so what I'm trying to do here is kind of provide a North Star for where is it that we're working towards and why and what ties all these demands together. And really, it's, it's freedom. It's economic right. security. And, and we achieve that through passing a second Bill of Rights, recognizing that the initial Bill of Rights is incredibly important, but that the job is yet to be done and that to secure freedom for each and every American, we need to pass an economic Bill of Rights to complement it. 
I'm, I'm curious, Mark, if you ever like feel like you're bumping up against the um, parameters of your discipline, because I think a lot of people always think like, oh, economists are supposed to be these dispassionate, you know, uh, balls and strikes kind of observers. And, uh, you know, if, if the minute that a, that, a, that an economist starts talking like like you're talking now, they kind of get like in a lot of circles labeled as an activist right. or not serious. Or I, I think about how, you know, I read through the, um, you know, the MMT book and like, the, the Stephanie Kelton is kind of treated a little more like an activist than a serious economist in, in certain circles, I think. Um, like, is it hard to write up something like an economic bill of rights and be and, and, and kind of muster up the courage to be like, you know, I'm going to come out here with this. And yeah, people are going to say, oh, you're you're an activist. You're just, you know, uh, you're not to be taken seriously. Like, how do you how, how do you handle that? I, I ask because I feel like we need more people like you. And I feel like a lot of people in your in your discipline get scared off by the prospect of being taken uh or being being labeled as like an activist or or a left winger or something like that like did you bump up against a lot of that do you find yourself like kind of struggling with that i bump up against it all the time i mean the discipline you know economics as a discipline is the most conservative discipline in the academy right. i mean yeah. you look at sociology anthropology political scientists you know these are all pluralistic disciplines that you know, acknowledge and respect that there are a range of thoughts and there's a range of, of ways to approach, you know, one's studies. And economics used to be like this too. I mean, when you read the great classic economists, and I'm going to say names that span, you know, the political spectrum, Adam Smith, you know, Malthus, Ricardo, Marx, you know, um, you know, all, all the way up to basically Keynes. I mean, these were great thinkers that work to integrate not just economics, but economics with history and political theory. And that's precisely what I try to do in this book, not to put myself in the same league of, of those giants, but to uh, don't to, sell yourself to, short, yeah. give yourself some time, <laughs> <laughs> but to take, take a similar kind of more holistic approach. We, you know, look, I mean, there's plenty of economists that are essentially applied mathematicians that just sit in their office, run some numbers and spit out some results but but what they're not doing what they're not thinking about is what is the point of the economy what direction are we you know aiming to shift the economy and then why and those are the key questions today i mean our two i would argue our two most pressing economic questions today are the climate crisis and our persistent inequality crisis where you know tens of millions of americans are are essentially you know living paycheck to paycheck or, or you know not really living at all because they're just denied income. And those are our two biggest challenges. And that's, you know, in my career, what I've set out to focus on. And, you know, does that push me to the fringes of, of the discipline sometimes? Yeah. You know, I'm actually a professor of economics, but in a public policy school. I'm at Rutgers University, a, a large research school. But, you know, I'm not in an economics department at, you know, Harvard or, or Columbia. Although, you know, hey, people like Joe Stiglitz at, at Columbia, I mean, what's funny is he's not even in the economics department. His home is in the business school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> precisely because, you know, economics is just such a screwed up discipline. So, you know, but your question, does it concern me or does it worry me? No, I don't lose any sleep over it because my fight isn't for the heart and soul of economists. It's for the heart and soul of the country. And it's it's to change how we as political actors, you know, engage with our economic and political system. Um, and so I take the tools of economics and what I learn from the discipline and I apply them, you know, very intentionally to, you know, a project to, to restructure the economy, to, to serve human ends rather than to serve moneyed interests. Gerald, this is a lot like our, like our running joke where it's like, Oh, here's how, here, go do economics. No, 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 yeah. not like that. Yeah. Not like that. Not like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what were you going to say, Jerry? Do it the Sorry. right way, not the wrong way. Do it our yeah. way. No, no, no. <laughs> doing it wrong. Um, You're doing it wrong. No, it's funny to ask. Like, I, I, I enjoyed your book tremendously. Um, and like I said, it, like, it really did feel like shaking off dead skin. It really did feel like realizing I had been asleep. And I, you know, COVID and quarantine were like, the, the, you know, I literally had to unplug my entire life. And this, this really did feel like hitting the reset button. Um, reading this book. So I wanted to ask um, for those who, A, buy the book, uh, uh, The Ends of Freedom, uh, available at fine booksellers everywhere. Um, once they read the book, what, what is it that you're hoping that they do upon completion of the book? If they were to read oh. it the right way and not the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great question. You know, I, I mean, two things. So one is this summer, I'm hoping we're going to have a, a resolution in Congress introduced uh, calling for an economic bill of rights. So, you know, ca call your 
member of Congress and tell them to support the various ideas in the book. I mean, there's legislation already today introduced on many of the rights that I cover from, from, you know, a green new deal covered in the right to healthy environment to Medicare for all call your member of Congress and explain to them why they should be supporting these ideas. Um, and the second is, is to, you know, continue to engage in our political system because for lack of, you know, for lack of a, you know, alternative way, we have to realize that that is how we make change. We make change through yeah. politics. We make change by voting, by knocking doors, by phone banking, by donating. If we have the financial ability to candidates that are actually championing, you know, the American people. And I think that there are, you know, we live in a very exciting time where the tectonic plates of our political system are shifting faster than they have in any of our lifetimes. And we actually have candidates out there that are, are truly, I think, fighting for, you know, the working class and fighting to, uh, you know, ensure that that people are actually taken care of, that people have jobs and have homes and that we prioritize community over profit. And so I, I think that that's particularly exciting because if you were in the, you know, 1990s, early 2000s, I mean, you really had just essentially almost no options at play, right? You know, mm -hmm. if, if Bill Clinton was the best you could hope for, I mean, you're up shit's Creek. Um, but today, I think, you know, we're in a far more exciting time, particularly yeah. getting involved locally. I mean, everybody wants to get involved nationally, but look, local politics is where it's at, whether it's getting on your school board or volunteering in your, your town or county. You know, uh, it really matters. It really does. I almost feel like if you were to create, and I'm not an economist, so I wouldn't, and I'm, I'm not even very good at math, but if you were to, or stats, but if you were to create like almost like a, um, uh, like an index of which states stand to benefit the most from the implementation of your plan of, of an economic bill of rights. Like, I feel like Florida would be at the top. I feel like yeah. almost everything that you can diagnose about what's wrong economically with living here, you can trace to something that would be, um, at least that, that there's something curative within what you've written that, that, that would address a lot of it. Like, I, like I, it, it feels like, it, it, and what's what's ironic is that it's a state where it feels like least possible to realize these kinds of uh, reforms. Um, it, it feels like we're so far from it. Um, and it's great to hear somebody like you enunciate, you know, a path forward. But like it, it, it really, I th the irony is not lost on me. That, yeah. You know. But do you remember how quickly times can change, right? I mean, I moved to Florida right as Andrew Gillum was running for governor. And mm. I'm thinking I'm moving to the state and going to help ride <laughs> the blue wave and Florida's <laughs> changing. And, you know, of course that didn't happen. Right. Uh, I went in a different direction. But, you know, I, I think in 10 years, we could see a very different Florida than than the Florida we have today. I, mean, I think the direction of Florida is deeply troubling to me in terms of protecting the people's basic rights and freedoms. You know, I mean, it, w what's funny about it is, is here you have conservatives trying to champion small government, yet they're constantly infringing on people's personal lives, you know, dictating who they can and cannot marry, trying to dictate what women can do with their bodies and the like. I mean, that is infringing on their rights. So, you know, they, they, they're really talking out both sides of their mouth at the same time. Yet, you know, unfortunately, we know that people like Ron DeSantis have, have no problem, you know, being a, a snake and a liar. So, Hey, be nice yeah, to our guy. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's dealing with a so, lot right now. <laughs> he's dealing with a lot right now. Like, give him, give, give him some grace. I have no sympathy for our man, Ron. <laughs> no. Nope. Uh, our guest today was Professor Mark Paul, assistant of professor of economics at the Edward J. Bluestein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. Again, follow him on Twitter at Mark Vin Paul. Get his new book, The Ends of Freedom. It's available now on his website, Mark paulecon.com and like gerald said a moment ago it's um, also available in uh, booksellers near you fine booksellers the non-fine ones only the finest yeah the non-fine ones only the yes <laughs> the fine the fine ones and two shitty yes. ones but we won't tell you which ones um <laughs> mark uh thanks for thanks for thanks for joining us we really appreciate it it's been a pleasure